Welcome to another episode of Peers Over Beers, your favorite digital and social evangelist podcast with your industry veteran hosts, Chris Tetzel. This podcast starts now. So welcome to another Peers Over Beers. I'm Chris Detzel, and I have a special guest today. My name is John Connor. John, you're, you're it's, it, on the Zoom, it says John Thomas Connor. So, you know, I wasn't sure how to present you. That's oh, why I let you do it. it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> makes sense. makes sense. Yeah, I just a lot of people have the name John Connor. So I had to throw out the middle name, you know, for SEO reasons. <laughs> yeah, the Terminator is one of them. I have no idea. <laughs> what you could be referring to <laughs> yeah you, you wouldn't know uh it's kind of a, a movie that used to be around back in the day um so tell me john about a little bit about who you are what you do and you know uh then we'll get into kind of the community stuff yeah so i am the co-founder and ceo of factura uh at factory.art and we create no code tools uh, that enable brands and creators to launch advanced NFTs that can respond to live data. Uh, so we focus on really two buckets of innovation. One is making sure that everything is on your site. So we provide embed so that you can mint on your own website, sell the NFTs fully under your control, uh, you own the smart contract. Um, and then we've created a dynamic NFT architecture that allows for NFTs to update in response to live data. You said a lot there, John. Yeah. And uh, I want to break it down because, uh, you know, NFTs have been around for a little bit, but not mainstream. You know, like I've never talked to a company about NFT stuff. So I'm highly interested. One is what is an NFT? And you mentioned a lot of kind of live data, data, you know, and all that kind of stuff, which is interesting. So can you talk a little bit about that? What is an NFT, first of all, and, and what are you trying to accomplish? Yeah, so first of all, an NFT, you know, is a non-fungible token. A lot of people mm -hmm. have heard that phrase. It doesn't explain a whole lot. And you can essentially think of it as an entry. All of this is an entry in a database, okay. except instead of that database being controlled by a company that might have incentives to change what's in the database and have the power to change what's in the database without anyone knowing or being able to check them, the database that this NFT is connected to is open and decentralized so that people can see it, right? Yep. And so an NFT as an entry in this database is an indication that you own something. So it's public proof that you own something. Got it. Right. And what you own can be, you know, a lot of people talk about, you know, NFTs being owning JPEGs. That's obviously, you know, mostly a joke. It's a joke to people making fun of NFTs. It's a joke to people in NFTs too. Right. <laughs> uh, and so an NFT could be anything really from an image. It could be a pleasant image to something as advanced as, uh, you know, the keys to an entire platform. Right. Uh, and uh, anything in between. So uh, it could be code. It could be media. Uh, it could be just an indicator that you own something like real estate. Um, again, I know this, this sounds complex. And there's a lot of pieces. But at the end of the day, it's just an entry in a public database that no one can centrally control, right? That no one can tamper with. That indicates that you own something, right? It sounds so Web 3.0. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's, that's the key phrase. Uh, that's exactly what it is. Uh, NFTs are going to be the way that I think most people get onboarded to web 3.0. Um, and that, that phrase has meaning because we're coming from web 2.0, yeah. um, web 2.0 being companies like Twitter and Facebook and really blogs, even where mm -hmm. users started generating content, um, and, uh, instead of the companies having to generate all the content, the, the websites themselves having to generate all the content. Um, except in, in those cases, you, you generally get, you know, a tiny ad share. If there are ads like on YouTube, things like yeah. that. Um, or, you Google know, ads, you just get to use the like tools. Yeah, yeah, Google ads, or you just get to use the tools, right? And, and they just get to take the data. They can take all the advertising. Um, the companies kind of determine the terms as well, right? They own it, yep. And, and so, as you mentioned, now we're talking about Web3, right? This idea that instead of Twitter's database, where they can get to determine what uh, gets said, 
And, you know, let's say you have money in a Twitter account, money yeah. in a PayPal account, money in a Venmo account, you know, Twitter is tipping now. Uh, that is in a private database and they can take that money away. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and you can argue with them, um, but they <laughs> more than likely can probably uh, outweigh any given individual in court in proving that they don't have that money in the first place. They didn't have that money, right? They control the entire database, right? It's theirs. They own it. Uh, I mean, obviously, we like to think good of people that they'll be honest. But uh, again, at the end of the day, um, one of the core principles of the entire Web3 space uh, of blockchain, but really the entire Web3 space is, per, um, uh, sorry, what's the phrase I'm looking for? Uh, there's permissionlessness, um, but trustlessness, Yeah. right? So you don't have to trust the database owners. You don't have to trust Twitter. Right. Yeah. So again, we went down a bunch of rabbit holes here on uh, no, explain what an NFT is, but that's to, you know, um, I want to make it concrete, but also abstract because the abstraction is important because if it's too concrete, if people just think of it as just an image or a piece of art, then it's like, well, that's dumb. That's just a digital thing. It's not like the real thing. It's different, yeah. but you have to get the right mental model in order to appreciate the potential value that the technology can bring. Hmm. It's intriguing. And as I kind of think about, thank you for that setup, because I think that's helpful. It's still confusing to me, but I think that just being in it all day, every day, somebody like you, you get it, you understand it. And and the more you get into something, the more you understand it. The the thing that when I hear, think of NFTs, you know, I think of, you know, like Jimmy Fallon or Reese Witherspoon and those kind of things, you know, talking about, Hey, I created my own, you know, NFT and, and things like that. So that those are the ways I've heard it. And I've even heard from what's that uh, guy's name that's, you know, this amazing speaker, just motivator or whatever that talks about it all the time lately. NFTs. Oh, Gary um, V. Yeah. Gary V talks about yeah. it all the time and it's, talks about it's the future and things like that. So it's intriguing to me for sure. And, and what's more intriguing is kind of this, uh, you know, the thing, the last year or two, the, the NFT community has really taken off like crazy. And, but I'm not 100% sure I understand what an NFT community looks like. Well, I've been building communities for a long time. And, you know, I think it's in general, when I think of community of users, it's this community of users that are, you know, interested in a very uh, similar thing. And they talk about those kinds of things. They help each other, you know, and different ways and, and, and get better at a certain thing. So if it's a product, I assume it's NFT. Can you talk a little bit about what a community uh, of NFT users would look like to you and, and what the, maybe the yeah. value of that would be? Absolutely. And, um, you know, I think this is a very delicate topic. I think it's one that can be made simple, but I say it's delicate because it's very easy to run into the issue whereby what you see the most is what determines the meaning of words. And so, for example, in the NFT space, the phrase community gets thrown around a lot. And the word more, community does, by the way. But yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Um, and uh, yeah, what you see a lot of is that phrase being utilized in order to maximize profit gain, right? It, it's people in the space know that it's a concept that is still abstract. Yeah. People don't know what it needs to mean to have meaningful community, to have successful community, to have rewarding community, to have valuable community and whatever value they might have. Um, and a lot of times that's financial and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, and so because there's this ambiguity, it's, it's, it's the wild west, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that means you have some people that are brilliant innovators, pioneers that are developing community in a way that I would say is leveraging NFT technology and leveraging blockchain technology in a meaningful way. And by meaningful, I mean um, allowing for types of connectedness, allowing for types of incentives that drive types of connectedness that could not have existed otherwise. Whether or not you think it's good or going to achieve its goals, they're exploring tools of of, of connection and, and community incentivization and governance and power sharing, right? And, and really, just at the end of the day, it's different ways of organizing people, 
organizing people and resources and effort. Mm -hmm. um, so the pioneers are, are doing that with these communities, right? And, and there's a lot there. I can unpack that in a minute. But then, you know, there's a lot of hype communities where it's all about like, you know, uh, either one prom like promising big things on a roadmap that they don't have the technical capacity to deliver. Um, like, okay, cool. You're going to build an entire metaverse game. If you sell, you know, $2 million worth of your, worth your NFTs, like real game studios fail at doing this kind of stuff all the time. Yeah. The idea that some random five anonymous people on the internet that <laughs> could barely launch an NFT project, uh, could pull something like that off with $2 million, you know, and, and I'm not, and I'm not talking, calling out anybody in particular, any projects in particular at all. Um, I think there's a lot of smart people in the space that will deliver on their on their projects, on their promises, but it's kind of like Kickstarter on crack in that sense. Except um, when you buy into a project, I'm like on Kickstarter, what, when you buy in, you get an asset and that becomes tradable. And now what happens that you have that asset, it can be worth more money. What makes it worth more money? The story that everyone tells about it. Yeah. Now you're a part of it and you have an incentive as one of the people that owns an NFT in this collection whether it's a piece of art or a fundraising tool or a token to, to events, part of your job, like by definition, part of your job in the abstract, you have incentives, the value goes up, is to get people excited about it, to build the image that this is worth something, that it's meaningful to be a part of this community, that it's valuable, that maybe uh, it'll even make you more money. And you know what? You can say things like, I'll never sell mine, even though you know that you'll sell yours at some point because you want to make money. You'll never sell <laughs> yours though, because this project's going to be so huge, right? It's yeah. going to, it's going to go to the moon. It's going to be worth so much money. So, so that's the complication. How do you know when people are genuinely buying into a project, have a vision and their community buys into a vision that they can achieve and that they're, they're properly aligned versus people that are trying to make a bunch of money. You're their experiment pretty much. And they're just using this, this essentially as a crowdfunding mechanism where they don't have much responsibility at all if things fail. So how do you tell the difference? That's, that's where things get interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, so again, uh, th there's a lot there. I was answering your question, like what does community look like in the NFT space? Again, yeah. there are innovators, there are pioneers, there are people that are trying to, uh, you know, for example, do nonprofit-esque things with nfts right and there are people that are just trying to make a bunch of money um, and trying to build their community and hype people up um and then and then there are just you know people that appreciate whatever the community is about uh, that's one of the cool things if we can, you can you can make it a lot simpler than than all the crazy stuff i just got into and just be like think about meetup right yeah if instead of like you know you gotta have some skin in the game you can think about it that way you gotta have some skin in the game you can't just like show up to these events Hmm. So like, all right, what if you had to pay a hundred dollars for an NFT and then you get to go to the meetup and it shows you actually care enough about this thing. You got some skin yeah. in the game and you're willing to pitch in, um, maybe even like make something uh, like a community project together. Maybe that's a part of it. Maybe it goes to that automatically. Maybe the group is small. Maybe it's big. Maybe you guys are artists. Maybe you guys are writers. Maybe you guys are weirdos. Maybe you guys are whatever. Headbangers, you know, whatever. Yeah. yeah, whatever. You can generate community around it and an NFT um, as a technology for communities operates as a mechanism to generate funds, um, to obligate funds, even, you know, you could use even technically sometimes in a smart contract where only certain amounts will be released after votes that approve that certain measures have been met, you know, at different stages of like a project's development, let's say, right? Um, so someone just can't run away with like $4 million that's raised in a project to like, I don't know, build a Dow forest tree house. <laughs> that's a spin on what some, what, what, what one group is actually doing cabin Dow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so yeah, again, I, I, I I'm, I'm spinning out. There's a, there's a, there's a lot. We can uh, bring it down to earth anytime. What does, so I'll try to bring it down to earth the best I can, but what does a Factura community look like? Like some, something at your company, what, what would, you know, you, you seem interested in this very much of a community kind of stuff. It sounds like you're also um, doing some interesting stuff within NF, the NFT space as well. So what kind of community would you like to see and, and, and 
how would it help? Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. So there's like two primary areas of community that we really focus on. Um, and it can really be broken down to the category, like the two parts of our company. So there's, there's Factura, the software, software platform, yep. right? We're a SaaS. We're a traditional Web2 company in that sense, who is trying to bring Web3 to the Web2 world. Um, yep. And that's, you know, why we're building tools for creators and brands and allowing them to do more advanced things, connect things from the Web2 space and make it really easy instead of having to set up wallets and do all this complicated stuff. Um, for example, we're working on an integration right now that allows you to pay with credit card. Um, and then all you have to do is put in an email address and you don't even have to have a, uh, you know, a MetaMask wallet or a crypto wallet or have Ethereum or anything like that. And you can buy and receive an NFT. Um, That's cool. And then you can always transfer it to a, pro, you know, to a private wallet, any wallet you want at any time. But we generate one for you. Um, so, so that, that uh, I can that I can put my head around because that's the kind of communities I build yeah. are for yeah. SaaS companies, right? Uh, software SaaS companies. So that's right. There's a lot of opportunity just in that particular type of community, right? Yeah. And so for us, like, for example, that means like I'm on LinkedIn uh, mm -hmm. and I'm connecting with a bunch of people in a bunch of different groups. That's how we got connected, actually, through people yeah. on LinkedIn. Yeah. And uh, they're doing things like this, introducing like, hey, oh, you're working on a tool that does this. Well, I mean, like, you know, that's kind of how we know that we solve a problem is every time we talk to someone, they're like, oh, my God, it solves this. Talk to this person, you know, yeah. like um, as a startup, that's the most valuable thing for us. And so that community building for us has been super organic. Um, obviously, we're doing things like, you know, planning posts and we have marketing that we're going to be doing everything like that to like really build this out and. Once our API is live, then we're going to be building a more technical community around that where it's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, not only can you use these tools, um, but developers, you can build things with this and they can get pretty crazy again because we have this dynamic NFT architecture um, that no one else is, is really doing stuff like this. So like once we have those tools live, our community is going to shift from just this like B2B focus. We're building a product. Give us feedback. We can help you launch to more of this like, it's, we're also incubating innovation directly in the community um, with our tools um, and trying to push the boundaries. Um, so, do you so use like category. a do you use like a Slack or what kind of tool do you use to bring these community people together, the users? So right now, we're, I mean, we're in a little bit of a transition. We're in an early stage because we don't have a lot of the tools live yet. We're like okay. hand holding all the project launches, so. Right now it's just on, it's on LinkedIn, right? I'm a part of yeah. a couple of LinkedIn groups and it's all being kind of like privately managed. Um, yeah. And then we have a discord for our art projects, which I'll get into in a second. Okay. Um, and uh, we also have a private group on there where we're managing some of the conversation, but um, we are going to launch a discord that is dedicated entirely to Factura. Once we're a little bit closer to the MVP and we're doing some live beta testing. Yeah. And again, we're gonna be focusing on those things like helping people launch projects, I'm getting feedback from them, getting feature requests, um, making sure that, you know, we go over the business use cases for the ideas that they generate. You know, it's like a lot of people have ideas in this space. And if we can like uh, develop a system where we're getting feedback from the community and it's like, well, yeah. is this a genuine innovation or is this just kitsch or what? Well, you you know, know, they can vote on these ideas and they can add additional kind of insights to some of this stuff, you know? So it's, it's a great opportunity, you know, for your product managers to, Kind of look at what people are needing and wanting and, and you know but some of this is you're just gonna have to create yourself you know because yep. nobody knows <laughs> yeah exactly and so like i mean we have a really nice ux we've designed and that's what's between now and, and mvp because we have all the functionality developed we've been launching projects we have a big queue of projects that we're going to be launching some of them which i can i can get into in a little bit because um again there a lot of them are dynamic nfts which uh i, I think are the future of nfts um mm -hmm. But yeah, so we're finishing up the front end and uh, we have a very, I think, efficient UX. Obviously, there's you know, no great ideas survive meeting the market. I'm sure we're going to get a lot more feedback. We've already gotten quite a bit. But um, that was one of the things that we kind of had to, to check ourselves on when it came to like figuring out like, okay, making no code solutions for certain things like, okay, this is like going to be a form and this is going to be drag and drop and this is going to, mm -hmm. you know, this is material design guidelines for this kind of stuff. That's one thing. But 
when it comes to like dynamic NFTs, which is hardly even like a phrase being registered yet, and you could any variation, right? Live NFTs, NFTs that respond to data, data driven NFTs, connected NFTs, you know, wh- however you want to describe them, there's not a phrase that has fully caught on yet um, in order to dominate the conversation. But uh, my point there is that, you know, a lot of the UX is simple and we're trying to keep it simple. Uh, we can always improve it later. Uh, we're going to be gathering a lot of data, doing a lot of user interviews, but we want to keep things obvious, clear, simple, you know, very um, uh, traditional design patterns. Um, and then when it comes to creating dynamic NFTs, though, we're creating tools that are kind of like like designing Photoshop, right? We're, try- we're approaching this as a new medium almost, but yeah. design is a part of it. But then the sales flow is a part of it too. It's like, you know, an NFT can contain a lot. Um, and especially when you add the fact that it can change over time and respond to data, it becomes pretty mm-hmm. much its own, its own program, right? It's, um, it can be very simple, but it can be infinitely complicated. Um, and so that's where like the UX innovation is, is going to get pretty interesting on our end. Yeah, it's, that's really cool. When you say dynamic NFT and, and there's not really um, coin phrase, I guess, is that, is that right? Uh, that nobody really yeah, knows what I to mean, call it yet? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, like the NBA had a drop that they released about a month ago, not, not Top Shots. Their more recent one were dynamic NFTs. Yeah. And people have been saying the phrase for over a year. Uh, we had been working on dynamic NFTs for over a year, but there was just like no SEO around it. And, you know, then they just took over the SEO, right? Now it's just like, you would think that they're the only dynamic NFTs ever made. Um, but it can be confusing too, because like even if you Google it, Chainlink comes up mm-hmm. and Chainlink, this is, this is another rabbit hole. They, uh, they provide a technology that allows for uh, randomization, like provable trustless, right? Mm-hmm. On chain, on blockchain randomization so that's like if there's a contest or a lottery you can prove it's fair right and not not rigged in any way so they call that dynamic nfts nfts that utilize that random generation um but that's different than the way we look at it which is any data right whether it's time a random number um you know in case in the case of nba it's uh you know player stats right update the nfts um, for us, that's like, that, that, that's an awesome use case, right? It's, an, it's a, a novel use case. It's a collectible use case, but there's also functional ones. There's ones that can offer utility and uh, beyond just a promotional item or a collectible item um, that we're exploring as well. It seems like you have an opportunity to kind of own the SEO space for this NFT stuff. I mean, there's a lot of shit out there. That, you know, some of it's right, some of it's wrong, and who really knows, but I think like a company like yours, if you cared to, could own it, you know, and coin the phrase the way you want to by creating just a shit ton of awesome, you know, uh, content that gets to where you want to go. You know, like example is it's one example of many different content types, but you build this website that's really awesome. I don't know if you really want to build a 2.0 website, but, you know, you'd have to, to some degree, right? Uh, that is just traditionally you know, really great content, whether it's, you know, Mm -hmm. creating a podcast around NFTs and all the things that you want to know about it. And then creating a, a, you know, a transcript that pushes out directly to the website. So you can get really good SEO, creating blogs, creating videos and and things like that. I mean, the opportunity is there for the taking, I would assume, because it's such a slightly new stuff, right? And, And you could just kind of mold it to the way you would like. I don't know. That's, yeah, that's the way so, I kind of see it. The opportunity is big for you. You're completely correct. I mean, you know, whether or not that's true in the sense of like, you know, we might get steamrolled by like Adobe or something in a month, but that's our plan right now. Right. So um, again, not to toot our own horn, but I, I think, you know, if you Google around the evidence speaks for itself on um, the concept, no matter what you label it, of NFTs that live update with data and specifically the way we're approaching it um, because we're not just updating the, the metadata on chain, which requires a transaction, right? NFTs are these mm-hmm. like permanent things. So if you update the metadata on chain, that, that can be dynamic, but it requires a transaction. It can cost gas. It's a lot more complicated. 
Um, it's going to be a lot slower. Um, it's going to be a lot less dynamic for sure. Um, <laughs> instead, we've come up with a unique architecture that essentially brings the full power of web applications from interfaces where you can collect data verified by the NFT owner because only the owner could interact with it. Um, the NFT itself, right? You don't actually have to have it on the website or anything. Um, to, you know, like I mentioned, like art that updates in response to any number of things, including what multiple people are doing, right? Can, art, the art can update collaboratively based on what multiple owners or mo what multiple art artists do. Um, and uh, yeah, really in, in, in that domain, we're trying to explore as many use cases as possible generate blog posts and then generate videos that explain them as well so that yeah. that's our, our current kind of go-to-market plan we're going to be developing those over the next couple of months we already have a couple that are going to be ready for uh for our first kind of round of testing next week um but yeah educational content that explores dynamic nfts what's possible you can do with the tech um then also like our, the abcs you know getting back to you know basics what, the, what are nfts tell you man the easiest way i mean yes you're doing the right things with the blogs and stuff like that that's just you know, you got to do that, but I'm telling you, man, create a podcast of some sort yeah. and get the transcripts, push them out to the main websites because that's, and, and what you do is you think about the topics that you want to cover. So for example, if it's dynamic right. NFTs, maybe you look at a series of, you know, three or four different uh, podcasts that you want to do that, you know, somebody in the space knows something really good about, or maybe it's just one of your experts. Right, you bring them in, and let's have a conversation, Q and A, thirty minute conversation. Push the transcript in, and then you can even write a blog around kind of that whole entire podcast. Right, and you push that into video, audio, and do a bunch of cool shit. Yeah, I, I mean, there's a lot of things like you. It sounds like you're doing some of the really good stuff, but you know, yeah, I think I think you're you're totally right. Like, I think I have. These podcasts been... are easy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, just you're right. you know, you and I can just get together and say, okay here's the questions that I want to ask. And, and think about it. Most people ask questions like, what is a dynamic NFT? Perfect. You know, you and I had a conversation about it. It's in this transcript. Then we could even write even a blog around what is a dynamic NFT, blah, 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 blah. You embed the audio or the video and, and it, you know, saying that, you know, John Carner, our CEO says this, you know, some, some creative, awesome, you know, thought leadership stuff, you know, and that kind of stuff, right? Because you, now you're kind of seen as, yeah, you're the CEO of this company, but you're also seen as the thought leader because really what, really what you want to be is you can ask somebody that's thought leader in the space, you know, or the, the leader in that space, because you don't want to just say, Hey, we sell this thing. All we want to do is talk about our product, which is important, but we also can guide you in the right direction on what to do with NFTs and yeah. things like that. We're not just selling you shit important that you do, but it's also yeah. being that high level kind of, you want to come to us because we're going to teach you all things NFTs, you know? And so that's just my thoughts around that. Yeah, no, I, I think you're a hundred percent spot on. I, I think the podcast, the fastest route to that content. I, I mean, I agree with everything you're describing. I think, you, you know, I've been a little gun shy around a lot of that kind of stuff just because we've been so heads down focusing on the actual yeah. tech. But now that we're launching all these projects, like I, like I mentioned, like, you know, we're going to be making blog posts and videos, but the same yeah. content, the same things that we're going over in these blog posts that explain the individual use cases for dynamic NFTs and how our tech is being Perfect. used. You know, those are, you know, good podcast conversations. I can interview my, uh, my CTO and we can get into exactly. the architecture a bit, get nerdy, uh, talk to the artists, right? We have a, a number of artists that we're collaborating with all of them. Um, exactly. We should interview. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, that's the thing I'm, I'm starting to, uh, kind of push my organization is, hey, look, we have experts here that are thought leaders, like our CTO and founder of Reltio. He's a great thought leader, and he's kind of seen as a thought leader in the space. But there's also our customers that are CIOs, CTOs that are thought leaders in the data space as well. So how do we get them on, yeah. on these? People want to be on these podcasts. And, and it's great to say, you know, Look, these artists or these CIOs that are our customers or not even our customers, but they know a lot. They've been doing this for a long time. They have lots of expertise and you're bringing that to them. It's not just you and your CTO, which is good, but it's also the artists, like you yeah. said, and other people that are, you know, in the space and what they're doing and, and the exciting because one, they get to kind of promote their stuff. But two is you get to promote that. Hey, this, this is what we're bringing to, to the team. Nobody else is, you know? 
Mm-hmm. It's, and it's yep. some sort of easy, you know, it's easy. Nothing's easy, but you know what I mean? I totally know what you mean. And I agree completely. I, I, I think on my end, it's mostly a matter of just like, you know, mm-hmm. putting together a couple of documents and scheduling things. Yeah. Time you is, know, show up and hit some bullet points, but yeah. Yeah. I think for you, you know, it's hard probably, you know, being in that kind of really startup kind of space. And then yeah. also how do I get out of that kind of, because eventually there's growth, right? Like eventually you get, I mean, you're a startup for a long time, but you know, it's still like, there's going to be another level that you as a CEO would want to probably go, right? Like, and then there's always different stages of that, uh, the CEO um, level, you know, you're the startup, you're just probably in the shit doing shit, you know, and, um, but then, you know, at some point you'll get staff here, staff there, and then, you know, you either let somebody else take it over and you'll be the CTO and founder, I don't know, whatever that is, you know, Um, but uh, it's good. Kind of cool to see, like what you guys are doing. I mean, you've yeah, done this before, it. though. Um, yeah, this is so. I mean, it depends on how you count companies versus projects and stuff, right? But <laughs> this is my second, uh, like, full on attempt at building a company. Uh, the first one I developed is my first entry into like startups. Period. I had zero clue what I was doing. You know, I taught myself everything. Taught myself how to code a little bit, how to build websites, uh, yeah. do some design market validate. I, I read all the books and made all the mistakes for five years. Uh, but I spent five years building that company. Ultimately, you know, we couldn't make enough money to like make it make sense. Um, but uh, yeah, it was an awesome experience. It led me to like working at a couple of high growth companies in a product capacity, you know, leveraging everything I had learned. And uh, being in NFTs uh, a year ago, uh, I started this company about 16 months ago. I was like, I can't be an employee right now. NFTs are too crazy. There's too much going on. And, and I honestly, I couldn't get over the idea that everyone was so focused on static NFTs, hmm. like, like just J, like pretty much just JPEGs and video loops. Yeah. They don't change, you know, it's like, it's, it's artifacts. And I'm like, uh, honestly, this feels like scratching the surface of something much bigger here. And, uh, philosophically, um, as tools of economic exploration, as tools of community, and then also as like programmable explorations, right? They're, they're literally, you can program NFTs to do anything, hmm. to, to only display certain, in our case especially, <laughs> uh, to only display certain things uh, only under certain conditions, if certain conditions have been met, you know, like only to give certain people access if they've done certain things, they only get the QR code to get into the event, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, um, and then it's an, it's an asset, right? It's something that like, you do all these things, you build all this tech into it, you build all this exclusivity, all this access, um, all these concepts. And that's what gives it value to somebody else. Um, speculation aside, speculation is a whole different thing. You know, that kind of skews real, real value, like, you know, experienced value. Um, but there is a lot that can be captured. Um, and then when, when it is captured by you, when your NFT, you know, response to things that you do levels up in whatever way and whatever systems, whether it's a loyalty program or some yeah. group advancing within some group, you know, it's on discord or something that gives you select privileges, um, that then becomes something that you can sell to somebody else, right? You're capturing your labor, right? So as a technology, um, not just NFTs, NFTs are a good starting point. But dynamic NFTs, NFTs that can evolve, NFTs that can respond to real world data, um, they can capture things that you do um, and convert it into something that is directly valuable and can be sold to somebody else. Um, And that is one of the most fundamental innovations of NFTs as a technology that a lot of people miss when they're focused on these like ape images, you know? (laughs) Ape images, I like that. well, John, this has been good. Anything else you want to kind of uh, dive into a little bit um, that, that, I, that we kind of missed? I mean, I was focused you know, on the community part, but. Yeah. Um, I went pretty high level with a lot of things. Um, uh, it might be useful, you know, to touch on just like, how are people going to start seeing this, right? How, is, how yeah. are they going to start seeing this in their lives? Um and some of this is like trends that I'm seeing. Some of this is like definitely experiments by bigger brands and we don't know it for sure. And some of this is like, well, we're building a tech and we're working on a decline. So I know we're at least going to see some of it. Um, but, you know, one, there's ways in which you're going to see NFTs. Um, so, are you know, the market's down right now. I couldn't care mm-hmm. less. You know, I didn't 
didn't impact anything that I said this entire conversation because we're just building. We don't really care about the price of you know random things in the market. Yeah. Um, as a company, you know, we're a technology company. We believe in what the technology is possible. Um, you know, what's possible with the technology. I mean, so um, you know, and that's that's the thing. It's like there are so many people building right now. And these are not the people that are tweeting every day and getting all hyped up and like trying to sell you again, right. random collections and get you to buy into their discord and stuff. Like there are so many builders out there that are quietly building infrastructure, technology, tools. Um, there's a lot of very smart people. A lot of them have money. We have a little bit of money. We have some funding. There's a lot of different companies with a lot of smart people and a lot of funding um, building a lot of different things for the space. And so, um, you'll see NFTs that are more accessible. Uh, like I mentioned in terms of being able to buy them with like, uh, credit cards and just using your email address, Yeah. but you'll also see NFTs, uh, in places where you actually don't actually see them at all. Um, there will be NFTs that you'll realize later, okay, this thing that you did in a game or in a platform, or as a result of whatever actually generated an NFT, and you won't even realize that you're participating in NFT ecosystems. Whether that's because it's a program that is being launched or because it's a part of a technical solution um, and, and respecting your privacy or something like that, there's just more and more ways that NFTs are going to be embedded in people's lives without them having to even think about it, right? Another simple example is a lot of phones like Samsung's phones, um, For you know, some of them are already launching with it, but all the phones in 2023 and beyond will have integrated wallets, NFT wallets, right? Mm. And they're just going to add more features to it. Right? Yeah. What's an NFT wallet? You can see your NFTs. You know, that's a great start, uh, but they're going to add a lot of features. They're a really big company and they sell a lot of phones. And that's just going to be built in. No one has to make any decisions. It's just going to be there built into their phone. I, you know, th that is interesting. I think that, uh, you know, slowly but surely this technology starts to come in into play. So if it comes into play on your phone and people really then it has the opportunity to take off, you know, and maybe it has taken off. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got companies like yourself building shit, you know what I mean? So I think, well, that I mean, it hasn't taken off. It's taken off in the sense that like, there's a lot of stuff being built, but like yeah. mass market, it's still super early adopter. It's in right? the infancy, so like yeah. everybody's talking about it. There's a lot of people that think they're really smart, but NFTs, it's like, you know, the, the trendy, cool yeah. thing to be like smart about. It's like economics and technology and also like all these things together. Um, but there's so few people that actually know what's going on that, you know, anybody listening, if nothing I said made sense, it's okay. I still highly encourage you like <laughs> dive in. You don't have to obsess with it, but like watch some videos, check out our website. We're going to be adding a lot of content that explains things. Uh, Factory.art. Cool. Uh, but like, you know, learn at least some of the basics because this is about to be in our lives in a lot of ways, very fast, a lot faster than people think. And a lot of people are uh, kind of sleeping on it, uh, which is okay, but there's a lot of opportunity and it, it's good to understand what this might uh, represent for our communication and, and, and a lot of other things. Well, John, this is exciting stuff, man. Uh, I'm interested. I'll be going to factora.art, uh, you know, very soon, uh, probably right after this and kind of check it out again. And, um, you know, I really appreciate you getting on today and, and, and just explaining one what NFTs are and what you guys are doing at Factera Art, you know, dot art. Uh, so it's really cool stuff, man. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Chris, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, awesome conversation. Uh, hopefully, you know, a lot of that stuff made sense. Uh, you know, feel free to let me know if there's any questions that come up from, you know, your listeners or yourself even at any point. Um, you can ping me and I'm down to answer, you know, any questions about NFTs, dynamic NFTs, where their value comes from, the future, the tech, you know, I will. let me know. I'm sure. Absolutely. I'm, I'm always trying to find better ways to communicate this stuff as well. Right. I'm caught up in my world. Uh, yeah. which is, it's, it's a lot to communicate this stuff, even to people in my space, but making that bridge is going to be critical. Yeah. I think, you know, and I'll say this lastly, just because it is so interesting. So a few weeks ago, you and I had a conversation for about 30 minutes and I was asking you all these questions about, NFTs and communities and you're like, you know, Chris, I live in this all day, every day. And sometimes I forget that, you know, people just don't know, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I appreciate you coming on because this, this is a hot, hot topic that you hear that's being, you hear a lot of people talk about, you know, and, and so thanks again for coming on. Yeah.
No, no problem. Uh, it was a great conversation and uh, I hope that your audience enjoys it. Let's be in touch. All right. Thanks for everyone for uh, tuning in for another Peers Over Beers. I'm Chris Detzel and our special guest, John Connor. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Later.